world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Black Woman, Everybody's Healer, by Hawa Y. Mire. There are five brick houses facing inwards. Inside live five sisters named Sorrow, Spirit, Displacement, Expectation, and Self. They live lonely and together, separate but connected to the cities determined to eat them alive. Some of the windows on their houses have been boarded up. Others are made of stained glass. There are invisible hands, feet, heart, and breaths that dictate their lives and occasionally send wind to rip through windows, silently pack up belongings, leaving some empty while others remain too full. The chronology of time is different here. Ages, Eras and narratives change depending on need. Some days their bones are frail, and others there are moments of dance, song, movement, and youth, starry eyed wonder. The sisters face into a shared courtyard filled with ashes, brick, tree limbs, flowers, and bees, train tracks at their back. God is the train tracks and the trains passing through, above, around, and present. Every rumble, every car, every honk, every beep, every blink of lights is a reminder of the divine. The sages live on the moon. They move between the faces of black women, past and present. Their curse is to sit shrouded in kafan, constantly awaiting a janaza so they can be moved back against the deep darkness of the stars. They would have never left blackness, but by necessity, honor bound to collect their sisters under the gaze of the night sky. Their blessing is to watch over the sisters, sorrow, spirit, displacement, expectation, and self.
to negotiate with wind, earth, water, and fire, to tread carefully and gently upon the backs that are littered with transatlantic trades, to make peace with the souls that are still churned deep in the ocean's belly, to carry their voices as wind, to pull up bones and lay them at the root of elder trees, to set aflame stories that live in whiteness, burn them black again. They are observers, sometimes interceders on behalf of those that are them. Watch time fluidly twisting the strings of fate here and there, sniping ends, laying bricks, replacing flowers, whispering songs. They are not healers, but are engaged in the work of healing. They are not saviors, yet are wretchedly inconsolable when unable to save, throwing themselves between the earth and sun in eclipse, desperate to get back home. They are not nurturers, yet tend the soils as far as their hearts love, leaving one to guard during wispy moon as the rest descend upon the forest and lay fingertips into the deepest of roots, braiding strands of hair into rakes to till the gentle soil. They are called by some the mules of the earth. Little is known about the brimming cups of potential that they balance inside of the moon. That is their legacy, to be shunned by the very whiteness that they shine upon the seas, to be stripped of their stories even while trembling with sacredness. And when the rains run red with the blood of blackness, they ask the oceans to gather, to weep, pulling tides from every inch of the world together so that no one sits alone in sorrow. They sit just above the starlit trapdoors in the sky and murmur in unison, There, there, cool your burning eyes. And when the rains relent, they drop their hands from beyond the sky, rest them upon fervent brows and whisper, to us you belong, to us you belong. Okay, hey Emmanuel. Hello, hello Eliza. So I guess we're both here because we haven't seen each other in a while, but uh, more importantly, because the Edinburgh International Book Festival gathered us together as part of the uh, Outriders program, and yes. we got to be hashtag Outriders5 yes. um, and do some really cool things and get to have a wonderful opportunity to travel and write. Um, so um, perhaps before we get stuck into conversation, we should introduce ourselves to the listeners. Would you like to go first? Um, yes, um, my, my name is Emmanuel Aduma. I am a writer, and uh, my most recent publication is A Stranger's Pose, which is a book of travel stories. Um, and um, besides that, I've also written, you know, nonfiction, written about art and, and some fiction as well. And I think that it's perhaps because of the book I, I wrote, uh, the travel book that I was invited to participate in this travel you know, journey, I imagine so. Yeah, well, I'm uh, Eliza Nyangwe, and uh, I guess I feel most comfortable describing myself as a journalist and editor. Um, and that was part of what really excited me about the potential to participate in this journey. Oh. So I've worked, um, yeah, in major newsrooms like The Guardian, and now I I'm dialing in from Amsterdam, where I moved to um, help set up thecorrespondent.com as um, as managing editor. So okay. it was, I don't know what about, so we got connected through uh -huh. uh, the festival yes. um, in 2018, 19. 2019, 2019, 2019. <laughs> 2019, it's all a giant blur now. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and what did you feel when you got that email? Did you get the email from Siobhan? I did, I did. I got it, I think I, I was probably traveling. I think I was somewhere outside of New York where I was mostly based at the time. And I remember thinking, oh, this is, 
incredible. Like that was my first thought. I mean, I had done some traveling in the past with a group of people. And for me, you know, what, what this felt like was an opportunity to revisit the idea of, um, say, traveling across the continent in some way. Um, based on the fact that I had done some work writing about those previous trips, and and I felt like I would reconsider my, um, you know, the form in which I write about this trip, you know, because one, I was going to travel with one person, so I didn't have to um, worry about a group of people, but most most importantly, because the logistics were going to be sorted out, right? I wasn't going to be worrying about money while traveling. <laughs> Or, or just, you know, um, whether I could, um, in a sense, afford the trip, but mentally and, and financially. So I think that that's, I felt really excited. How about you? Yes, I was, I, yeah, I, it was, it was such a stunning moment. I opened the email and I really thought that someone had made a mistake <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and it's one of nah. those ones you want to confirm yeah. if it's true, but you also don't mm. want them to know they've made the mistake because yeah. uh, should the opportunity then disappear. And, and I think what mostly stunned me was, uh, I guess as a journalist, um, you well, I don't know if this is true for, for people who are long form writers and mm. fiction writers, where you feel really just as, as, good particularly if you've spent any time working as a freelancer you, yeah. you feel just as good as your last gig right yeah and so you're just always chasing the next gig mm -hmm. um or you know if you're working as an editor you're really amplifying and trying to perfect other people's writing yes so yes. the the sense of your own visibility in the out in the outside world <laughs> at least mine was just mm. really warped and so to get the invitation and then to see who else had been invited on this trip. And of course, and for the practical reasons, thinking, what, I, sorry, don't listen to this podcast with your kids. Fuck, like someone is yeah. paying for yeah. me to, <laughs> to travel. Yeah. Um, yeah. And because of course I grew up traveling around Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when you live somewhere as home, you're not curious and inquisitive in the same way. Likewise, when you travel as a journalist, you go with a very specific agenda, mm -hmm. at least in terms of the questions you're asking, right? Good journalists go with questions in mind. And, and, yeah. and here was an opportunity to go with an empty head and Absolutely. to to like to be engrossed in the moment and to share that with someone else in real time and then to produce some some storytelling that would then be published by Cassava Republic Press. I just yes, like, I could yes. not believe <laughs> like all my Christmases had come at once. Yeah. Um, so then we fast forward to when did we, find, no, so then there's a process by which we sort of get paired together. Mm -hmm. The great matchmaking before you broke my heart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy that we're still talking. <laughs> got I, this. I am forgiving. Um, so then we and then we meet in Edinburgh. Yeah, that yeah, was what last yeah. August. Last August, yeah, mid August of last year. Yeah, and I mean, I I think that I have no idea. I don't think we even found out, um, or we know now how we were paired. Maybe you remember. I don't. I, I can't remember asking and getting a response about that. But we got paired. And interestingly, I think we are the only um, uh, mixed gender couple <laughs> in, the, in the whole thing. It's either there were two women or two men. Um, and, you know, we met in Edinburgh. We had, like, some kind of introductions. I remember you were, you had to jet, jet, jet out or jet off um, to back to Amsterdam. Um, and it was this day that we sat down in this, you know, pretty hotel and try to figure out what we're going to do. I had this very warped, um, uh, well, I don't want to say warped. I had, I say I had good intentions, but you did have you, good intentions. you weren't particularly, um, please, please, as I found keen out later, on your good intentions. keen on my good intentions, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, um, to, to write in response to some travel narratives that have been written, um, at the time, I had just, you know, I'd just written this travel book. I was, I had to always think about travel writing as a genre after I wrote the book, which, you know, didn't occur to me when I was writing the book. And, um, and I was now serious about it. I was, you know, I was like, what is, what does this genre mean? How can I, in a sense, participate in it? And I started reading um, a lot of travel books. I read, especially by people who had written about Africa. 
or about the African journey. So I read um, Graham Greene's Journey Without Maps, <laughs> um, and I, I thought to myself, oh, you know, I should, I should use this book as a guide and travel mm. um, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, where he had traveled, and, um, and write in response to it. And it seemed very, you know, interesting until we had that conversation in Edinburgh. And it it's clearly seemed like West Africa was not somewhere we would be interested in um, as yeah. a team. I mean, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't even keen on it in that sense of like, I really want to go to Liberia and Syria alone as much as I really had just this ideological point I felt like I needed to prove. There was also North Africa in that original, somewhere in North Africa in that original construction, right? Was it uh, Morocco or Algeria? There was somewhere else that you yeah. also had, had identified in North Africa for the same reason, right? The overarching concept uh, was these people who had taken, mm-hmm. who had written about Africa, had taken these sort of travel, these journeys, mm-hmm, and you wanted mm-hmm. to sort of retrace the steps and recast, yeah. or at least not... Uh, not enter into a debate or a discussion with them uh, across space and time, but mm-hmm. really to put your own lens on that same Absolutely. landscape. Um, yeah. yeah, I remember yeah, there, that. There was that. There was that. And finally, there was, um, you know, I think Angola, right? If you remember, right. there was yes. Angola based on this um, book by, um, you know, the Polish um, journalist um, or writer, Ryzat Kapaszynski, who wrote... I think it was called Another Day of Life, and he wrote it just at a time in, I think, the mid-70s when there was um, unrest, um, at the, I think at the beginning of some kind of unrest in Angola. And, and those were my ideas. But, I mean, I'm curious about, um, one, your initial, why you felt that would be problematic. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have reasons why I think it's problematic, but why you felt it was problematic and also... Um, what your original intentions when you started to think about the trip um, were? Mm. Yeah, I had uh, the first feeling was original anxieties. <laughs> Just, um, <laughs> that's, it, that's that's actually going to be the name of my story. Original, original anxieties. anxieties. That's so good. That's good. <laughs> um, because of course I felt so aware that I had wanted to sort of you know ship shape shift into yeah. this broader definition of what I did. But of course, uh-huh, so much about uh-huh. how we live is tethered to, you know, what we get paid to do. And so uh-huh. imagining ourselves outside of the boundaries of a paycheck um, uh-huh. is quite a, you know, it's quite a, a nerve wracking thing. So I had been really nervous about, yeah, being able to step up to the plate uh-huh. and really, you know, my God, Emmanuel Aduma, who people I know know, who has written books, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, what am I going to do, right uh, a, a stand, a lead for his headline. Like, what's what's that going to be like? Um, that is hilarious. Um, so there was oh. that, uh, and when I, you know, of course, um, you know, and I think a lot of people probably need to hear this too. Just mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. feel like, okay, I deserve to the, the space I'm going to occupy. So beyond that, it was really thinking. Oh. Um, I oh. want to lean into being uncomfortable because if I'm going to do this, why? keep myself in any kind of comfort zone. Let me thrust myself into it as much as possible, which meant rejecting every attempt I was feeling to try and structure it, to try and, aside from the destinations, because we obviously had to pick that to be planned, um, uh, I didn't want to, I was grappling with questions. I was thinking about sources of inspiration. And then I just decided to let it all go, which yeah. filled me with great trepidation and, and to to be responsive to what we encountered. Uh-huh. And so then when it came to planning uh, destinations with you, uh, the only thing that I had felt responsible for was the idea of completely sabotaging someone else's kind of dream journey, right? And yeah. here was, you know, the famous... Mr. Duma with some thoughts on where he wanted to go. And what I was hearing just was Mm. reminding Mm. me of all the the articles that I had been reading at the time that were getting published in the Western media where African writers were being invited to write about places always in response to something else. So whether it was African writers or black writers, we um, the sense was we couldn't just be or have uh-huh. um, an experience that wasn't in conversation with whiteness yeah. um, or with Westernness. Uh-huh. Um, 
And so that was really what I guess when I when I, I had seen your proposal, that's what really I was confronted by. Uh-huh. I was like, why should you? Why does it even matter? Um, what that Polish journalist or writer wrote about Angola, for uh-huh. you to revisit it would only bring back to the fore their what thoughts. Either. Right, and which yeah. might be, which should fall to obscurity if the time has come, right? Yeah. And they should it should remain part of our thinking and our exploring if it has some natural um, resonance still Absolutely, yeah. but if we were centering it as a way to justify our own exploration as a way to say hey i deserve to go on this trip because i'm responding to some old white guy's trip that i was just like no i don't nah. want to do that yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah and i think we came up together with an even better plan mm-hmm. completely you know so then we thought Let's just take the opportunity to crisscross the continent Absolutely. and do as much environmental destruction as we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, yeah. So we had initially thought north, south, east, west, center Absolutely. with Angola. Uh-huh. And then we Algeria, were confronted yeah. by the high truths of reality, right? Absolutely. So we then had Visa Wahala because you then uh-huh. moved back to Nigeria. And what happened uh-huh. next? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, even before I moved to Nigeria, um, I, I had like a work visa, a work U.S. visa. Um, um, which meant that, in a sense, I could apply from the U.S. to wherever I wanted to go to. Um, but then I began to realize that some of the countries, in particular, that we had chosen, I think we had chosen Angola, we had chosen Algeria, we had chosen Equatorial Guinea, and what was the fourth place? Um, um, I can't, what is the fourth five. place? There were five? <laughs> well, yeah. you know, we, didn't, we, 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 uh, we had Angola, we had Equatorial Guinea, we had um, um, Algeria. Algeria. Uh, Where in East Africa had we wanted to go? Before Africa. Uganda. Um, Here we go. Uh, was Madagascar always on our original list? Um, uh, I'm I, Algeria, I, Angola, Namibia, Madagascar, Namibia, and Equatorial yes. Guinea. Equatorial Guinea, yes. So, and then I found out that, you know, for instance, Angola was going, even from applying from the U.S., was going to be a nightmare applying for it. Um, Equatorial Guinea, for sure, had always been like some kind of closed country, right, <laughs> every time that I thought of going there. And so I think what we sort of agreed upon, um, you know, based on that Bissau Hall, it just seemed impractical to spend, you know, weeks upon weeks putting your passport down and not knowing whether you'll get the visa in the first place, especially mm-hmm. because our our reason for going was so loosely defined. We aren't going, you know, to give aid. We aren't going to, um, to, to, to be business people. We were going as this sort of like artist who, you know, we're also going on a whim, so to speak. Mm-hmm. That is very hard to define in um, bureaucratic terms. <laughs> right so yep. we ended up saying um you know we'll just go wherever our our passports could allow us entry into yeah. without the need for um visas or visa upon entry countries and it turns out that there are a lot of options actually when you think about it um even though some of them might be quote unquote less desirable um <laughs> you know or smaller um and we ended up i think with um for me going to uh we'll go we're going to go to madagascar and then to um comoros uh which neither of us had i mean i had probably heard of it only once in my life before then and um um, then uganda and then you would go to if i remember correctly egypt or or egypt and i would go to to cape verde as like the four countries um i would travel to and you would you know travel to um, so how did we travel? Like what, what was our itinerary? Oh, I loved that. The first decision we made was, uh, because we, there was a leap day, it's a leap year. Oh yeah. So yeah. we, yeah. <laughs> we were fair. like, we're not going to get this opportunity for another, yeah. let me not, my math, what is it? Four or five years? <laughs> <laughs> it's four years. It's four everything. years. There you go. Yeah. So we weren't going to get this opportunity for oh. another four years. And so we decided we, wherever we were setting off from, we would leave on the 29th of February. Yeah. Um, and that's what we did. And of course we had to then, mm. you know, when the, the rubber met the road and we, 
we revised our ambitions down from five to four. And then um, we really then spent some time thinking about how long we were going to stay in each place. I really felt like we had, I, Uh you know, I uh, had underestimated how long it takes to get your tentacles uh, into a place. So we got to uh, Antanana, <laughs> Antananarivo, Antananarivo. Uh, Tana, as we learned it. Yeah. Tana, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then we had a week in Antanarivo, um, not less than that. Huh? And then like three days, three full days in oh. Grand Comore. Uh, then oh, a week uh, plus in Uganda before we were then confronted by uh, COVID realities. So I was curious about of all the places that we had, we did manage to go and the experiences we had, which ones most struck you and who are the people who oh. really shaped the experience for you? Well, I mean, I, I, I hope I'm not being, um, in a sense, romantic, but um, I, I think the experience was really defined by the fact that we were traveling together um, in this, uh, particularly because we, you know, we were figuring out, this is places that we had never been, even though you could speak French and I couldn't. Um, it was also a new experience for you, um, the kind of people we're meeting, say yeah. in uh, Madagascar or in um, Comoros, where, um, in a sense, very specific to the fact that we were traveling to those places for the first time. So I think that really, the true line for me in all the journeys, especially because neither of us eventually went to the fourth countries with plans to travel, was that, you know, we had this, um, you know, very um, defined um, um, tr- travel experience by traveling together to places we had not traveled um, to before. Um, I think that I, I really, I mean, I have a hard time sort of passing out which was you know, my favorite place or favorite person. I mean, there were standout experiences for sure, right? You know, um, so in in um, in Comoros, of course, you know, our friend. Hamidu. <laughs> Hamidu, um, who became like the sultan of, of Comoros <laughs> by the time we were leaving, became for us. Not, I don't want to confuse anybody. He, did, he was not there. But <laughs> we were not there for his coronation. We were, we were there for his coronation. But for us, it became the grand sultan of of, um, of, of Comoros. And I think that really what happened to me was that by the time I got to Uganda, I, I felt like I, I had had like some kind of true, uh, you know, contained experience from Madagascar to Uganda. And um, I guess I can talk some more about that when I, you know, talk about, or when we talk about how, you know, what kind of writing we hope to do. But yeah, oh, you can already funny. start to tell me that. I'm curious. No, but so, I mean, you have to tell me what was, <laughs> was your favorite people. Who were your favorite people? Um, no, I think yeah, Hamidu um, as a as a character, as someone we met along the way, was just. And yeah. I had, I was trying in the you know it, with each week to um, to release um, uh, a newsletter in my personal newsletter, Grio uh-huh. Girl. Um, and so I was writing for Griot Girl and, and as a way to process and thinking about, uh, and, and Hamidou was my favorite, was my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what was, um, what was, what was interesting about him? What would you say? Oh, uh, Hamidou's swagger, his, like he had, so I think what is great about Hamidou, uh, for anyone listening is to mm-hmm. sort of like juxtapose him with the place. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. like Comoros is really small, um, it reminds me so much of the part of Cameroon I'm from. So mm. it's the Southwest with the volcanic um, rock and the black sand beaches, uh, but also extraordinary white sand beaches, but just uh-huh. really um, a sense of it being uh, stunningly beautiful, but at the same time, just really not particularly grandiose. And derelict, yet, yeah. Uh, right, derelict even. Uh, oh. And there was Hamidou, who, you know, drove this big car and covered <laughs> the seats with this kind of faux leather yeah. and, you know, spoke English and spoke French and, you know, was just this kind of wheeler dealer character um, who asked for uh, a rate because we met him because we had asked at the hotel 
for uh, a, a tour guide, if you will, someone. Essentially, we were looking for a driver oh. um, who could take us around the island. And um, Hamidou quoted us a rate that was extortionate compared to what we had been told by other people to expect to pay. Yeah. Um and he just was so grand, right? This is why he became the, you know, and we were going to, you know, as they say, you know, um, tie our clots, you know, kind of just, you know, um, we were going to to bear the cost of having Hamidu for one yeah. whole day. Uh, and then he just ended up kind of offering to come back the next day for yes. half par- price and yeah. then offering to come back the next day for free to take us to the airport. Yeah. Um and he, yeah, I just, uh, and then, you know, we took pictures together and he told the most ridiculous stories about yes. his girlfriend in Marseille and his wife, <laughs> you know, his wife in Marseille and his <laughs> girlfriend in, uh, on the, on the main island. Yeah. Um, uh, it was just, I mean, he was, yeah, he was larger than life. He was yes. ridiculous. And he was also really political, you know, talking a lot about immigration and pe- because of course, Comoros is an independent country, which is uh, part of a, a cluster of islands, one of yes. which still is part of the Republic of France. Yes, um, yes. And so that, and when you think about it that way, it's not part of France. It is France. It's it Europe. Is France. Yeah. Right. And the kind yeah. of mindfuck of thinking that actually people who are trying to get from Grand Comores to this other island are mm-hmm. trying to get from Africa into Europe. And Absolutely. it's less than an hour away. Yes, right? yes, yes. Um, and and Hamidou understood this so completely, um, and understood the kinds of dynamics it was creating amongst people, you know, uh-huh. in this sort of quest for a better life. It was really Absolutely. fascinating to to hear him talk. I I, I really appreciated that more than um, really many of the other conversations we I had so. anywhere else. Yeah, uh, Hamidou was great. Uh, I, th- I and think. Then, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, please go ahead. ahead. Tell me. <laughs> tell no, me, no, no. Tell I mean, me. I just want to. I just want to sort of buttress that point that he was for sure the most um, dynamic and complex person that we met on the road. I think that was precisely because we spent, um, I guess, two days with him, and he was not the kind of person that would shy away from um, sharing his life. I mean, he. He. I think it was. For maybe it was a rarity that he had people who just came to Comoros, not for anything else, but just to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, and because they, they had the opportunity to be there. And, I, and, mm-hmm. and I, I, when I was thinking about him after I returned, I felt this must have been something of, um, one, a novelty for him. Mm-hmm. But also I wanted to consider it from his point of view, right? You're in a place that is really small, a country... That even though it was, I mean, it's poor, but nobody cares about it. You could th- you could think about it that way, um, and he was, in a sense, able to facilitate the, um, the the trip of two foreigners who were from different African countries, mm-hmm. um, and I think that it must have been something, I hope, special for him as well, and so he gave himself in full. That's what you always saw. I remember that he was going to, um, you remember that he was going to like um, charge us um, a more exorbitant rate, right, um, for one day. And then he reduced it and then decided to come for two full days. Mm -hmm. Um, And as you mentioned, so there was something even generous. That's really what I'm trying to point out about his, his engagement with us. Yeah, Hamidou was um, Hamidou was great. He was really. I mean, I, I think about that point about whether it was I had anything to do with the length of time because what I learned from you really was that in the way you travel, especially for travel writing, you oh. know, um, not only is there a certain amount of planning, but there's a certain amount of um, uh, accompanying people so that you can learn and see the place through their eyes, which we didn't yeah. really have the opportunity to do because we were staying for such short amounts of time. So that kind of building up of trust and relationship, uh, as you rightfully said, actually, we did that more with each other than with uh-huh. people we met yeah. along the way. Uh-huh. Um, uh, but it was still really interesting when you compare him to the uh, to the gentleman who was driving us around in Madagascar, where we were there for much longer and covered 
many more kilometers with him. Um, we didn't know him in the same way. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder what that was. I think there's definitely a question of personality there. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But I also think that there was, yeah, I think the largest part was just Hamidou's sort of like um, desire to embed himself in our story as much as we were interested in yes. embedding yes. ourselves in his, yes. Yes. right? Um and I remember thinking when we got to um, to Uganda, Uganda for me, <laughs> Uganda for me was the 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 the, the sort of the anti climax of the trip. It wasn't <laughs> the end, but Uganda yeah. was definitely. And I remember thinking, oh, it doesn't, it it's not quaint like a small place, right? It's not small like Madagascar or Comoros, but it doesn't have the sort of big city energy of Nairobi or, you know, um, so many other, I'm sure Lagos, even though I haven't been, or Uh even Accra, it just felt, um, it felt like a place where to appreciate it, you needed to know people. You needed to be taken around by friends. You needed to be shown what was off the beaten track because otherwise you were going to spend all your time in sort of South African or, you know, chain restaurants or shop right or whatever it was. Um, And and so for me, actually, even though it was the Mm. place I was looking forward to because I had known people from there having gone to school in, in Nairobi, uh-huh. I found it. The, I found it the least um, energizing. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what your experience was. And I really had a dreadful time in uh, in the Nile. I mean, yeah. at the source of the Nile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it just it was kind of for me the ugly side of tourism. Uh-huh. You know, I, I, I'm marked in my mind by this image of a um, a Pepsi mm. ad sort of screwed into a palm tree. That for me just kind of encapsulated <laughs> my feelings yeah. about the source of the Nile. It just felt like it was like it was a bad amusement park. Yeah. You know, what was that like for you? That was not into amuse for sure. I mean, I think <laughs> that uh, <laughs> I think that when we were in Uganda, there was a sense that um, even though we didn't articulate it, and perhaps we can only articulate it in retrospect, we felt like we could have spent a week in Comoros. Um, and, and just in a sense, even if we had stayed in Comoros and just remained in Comoros, right, without even looking for any amusement or any tourism, just hanging out with, with, um, with Hamidou would have been like, a fuller experience than being in a city like Kampala or going to Jinja and, and really just being taken on this, you know, there were all these other things that we did in Uganda, going to this big cathedrals, and which, you know, it's interesting if you're trying to write some kind of, um, I guess, touristic account of being in Uganda, but as um, the experience of meeting people, there was little to inspire. Mm. And I think it's because we, we were both from, we, we knew that, that, um, that kind of setting to some degree, right? We knew the urbane. We knew what it meant to be in places that every, where you turn, you see a nice... I mean, we, we certainly enjoyed the coffee in Uganda. We did uh, enjoy <laughs> coffee. <laughs> you it you preferred your breakfast uh, in Uganda to yeah, Comoros, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. The food was better. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think that that, that what, what I, I feel like what happened for us in Uganda was that we suddenly realized that Comoros was a place that could give us more story. Um, at least in, in thinking about, you know, writing, that's what happened for me. Mm-hmm. That even the way I, I could write about, I felt I could write about Comoros was completely different from the way I felt like I could write about Uganda. And of course, you know, maybe a nice segue to talk about COVID was that by the time we were in Uganda, we were discovering, you know, all the limitations that we would face when we left Uganda, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think my wedding date was, you know, changed. You know, we, um, that we are not, you were not going to go to North Africa. I wasn't mm-hmm. going to go to Cape Verde. Um, all kinds of things began to happen, right? That we felt, okay, Uganda became this place of, um, uh, I guess, as you said, an, 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 you know, anticlimactic place where the limits of our trip um, became clear to us. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think like all the sort of the um, the sort of euphoria, the newness had. Uh, 
that we had in Madagascar had had worn off, then the kind of the sort of richness of the experience against a very simple backdrop, well, yeah. uh, in Comoros, uh, and then Uganda had left us both in a place where we spoke the language so actually we didn't need to travel together because we could then and and we hadn't at least let me not say we I hadn't anticipated Uh suddenly that my travel buddy would no longer be my travel buddy right Uh and 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 at the same time I wanted I wanted to allow for the fact that yeah actually um because I had felt very much um a custodian of your experiences in some ways in the other places because I spoke the language and you didn't and so I um um and so I didn't want to uh, I was so mindful of this sort of power grab that actually, no, you know, you might not want to continue to do uh, things together because um, you now have freedom of movement because oh. you have access to the language. Yeah. Um, and so all of these things were sort of playing at least on my mind. And then, of course, the dawning realization of uh, actually things can't continue to happen as we had imagined that they would yeah. because of uh you know the coronavirus spreading i mean i felt already as we were getting into uganda that i made it in by the skin of my teeth you know mm-hmm. like they yes, yes, they spent a long yeah. time palming my passport wondering when i asking when i had left the netherlands to be sure that i wasn't you know one of these europeans who was bringing <laughs> the deadly coronavirus in with me um mm-hmm. and that was an interesting experience sort of traveling through africa which is usually you know in the in the Western imagination, epicenter of disease and destruction, and feeling very much like you were in a safe refuge to Absolutely. some degree. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, up to the moment we left Uganda, you know, um, besides the fact that you would have to be, you know, you start we started seeing an in Kampala at least like, um, you know, um, hand sanitizers in every mm-hmm. public in- establishment. Um, there wasn't any sense of panic that I imagine, you know, was already happening in that was already existing in um, in, the, in in say the U.S. or in Europe Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, or Italy. Um, I do remember that. I mean, first of all, I mean, it was very kind of you to be um, my travel body in the way that you were. I do remember thinking afterwards how, um, in a sense, naive I was that I could have a different kind of travel experience this time. You know, even when I couldn't, you know, speak French, you know, I've done this kind of trip before where, you know, I'm like, why don't I know how to speak French? What is the problem? <laughs> what is a, <laughs> you know, and, and then to realize that I was stuck in that same position. And I felt suddenly grateful for your um, magnanimity in being just like, oh, this is part of my responsibility for this trip to translate for this guy. But the thing that I suddenly have to, in addition, say is that, I mean, I remember we had this conversation perhaps like, you know, in, 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 a, in a reserve, I think in Madagascar. And I, and I remember saying, we're having this conversation about how much of independence do each of us want to have, if I remember correctly. And I said, you know, for me, like this kind of trip, I have nothing prepared. Like I'm totally, even if I go to a place where I don't want to be, it becomes part of the experience for me. I don't discard it. I, and in the moment, it bec- it's, it's problematic. I mean, you're just in a place that you don't want to be. But for me, the writing becomes energized by that um, disappointment. And especially when, because we're in traveling to research something, we're in traveling to research Lemurs in, in Madagascar or anything. We were just being there and we had to look for activities to take us out of the hotel to take us into a place that, um, you know, was foreign, felt foreign. Um, and we were there particularly because it was foreign. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I felt like in Uganda, yes, for sure, like the language made it seem easy. But I think that as a result, that no, that the, the, as a result of the fact that novelty was over, mm-hmm. um, that in a sense curtailed the experience for, for me as well. Yeah. So you're back and in your life and much has changed there. Uh, But also you've, you have, you've done God work. You have created from nothing because you've written your story. (laughs) I'm I'm waiting for someone to breathe the life into my pen uh, because coming back to normality uh, has just been a roller coaster. also. Mm. Um, Actually, I'm so grateful for the trip because the space that it gives you, um, to be, 
as you know, the youngins will say in my own, in my feels, uh-huh. um, you know, to, to think all the thoughts that keep getting pushed by the wayside when you are hustling in uh-huh. your normal life, uh-huh. um, that really had far ranging repercussions for me. Um, uh, but you have written your story and you uh, have come out on the other side of it, right? What's the return been like for you? I know we have to, you know, wrap up our conversation, but I'm Shock curious me. about, um, yeah, what you have yeah, written yeah. and how you want it to be put in the world. Yeah, I mean, you've put me on the spot because you've made everybody <laughs> know that I've written something. Um, I mean, the, the teacher's first... pet. <laughs> the, Jesus, the 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 first thing to say, I guess, is that I um. You know, for me, it was very practical that I started writing immediately we, we returned uh, because I knew that by April, you know, we got, I think I got back to Nigeria March 19 and, you know, um, a nice aside is that by March 21 or 22, the, the international travels were banned in Nigeria and it's still banned at the moment. Um, and so I, I came back knowing that, okay, I had a few weeks um, to write about this trip because I needed to begin, um, you know, working on my manuscript for which I had signed a contract and I started spending the money um, <laughs> in April. Um, and that was, that was really what compelled me to write. I, I, I think that I don't know how else to put it, but that's really what happened, that I had no choice in a sense, I felt I had no choice. Um, and I didn't want to wait until, say, when I got an email, you know, whatever, you know, I just wanted to get it out of the way so that I could focus on something that felt, um, you know, new to me in some sense. And, you know, um, so that's, that's, that's the first thing. But I, when I started writing, I mean, we had this conversation, I think, right from the very first day, um, you know, the idea of conceits, right? What kind of conceits would we apply to this or create for the writing um, or for the journey and that would inform the writing and all that. And we came up with all kinds of ideas that, you know, certainly I didn't keep any. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, what I ended up with, you know, was to in some way write something that felt that that, that was some kind of like diary of my time in all of these places. So to create some kind of short diaristic accounts of not necessarily every day, but like most of the days that I spent in, 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 in Madagascar, in Comoros, and in Uganda. So, um, and then end up with like a fourth section, which was some kind of pandemic journal, right? Um, based on the idea that the days I was writing, um, you know, about a trip where the days I, I felt, I thought I would be in Cape Verde, you know, really writing about a trip, actually. That's what I planned to right. do in Cape Verde. Um, so that's really what I ended up with. I think that um, for me, that was, in a sense, an attempt to really just write something that was simply an account of the everyday, right? Um, I, I, I've never been interested in writing about um, the continent from the point of view of sociology um, or like thematic issues. I have been very interested in what it meant to be in a place and how everything that I brought to that place interacted with my feelings of being in that place. So I have not, I mean, at this point, the piece is not finalized. So I really don't know what Cassava Republic would say if I would have to write a piece from the start. <laughs> which I dread, I hope not. That's my original anxiety, actually. Mm. Oh, my original anxieties. Yeah, hmm. yeah for me, I, um, I was thinking about this, really inspired by the work you did with The Stranger's Pose to just be present and to your, all your senses to pick up and respond to what was happening in the place. And, and then I became increasingly aware of what was happening in my own internal landscape, which was actually this, the places um, were only resonant to me or when they were was because they really spoke to something that was happening internally. And so there was this oh, oh. inner landscape um, oh. that was, you know, and, and, I, and I really want to explore that with the, with the writing, with the story oh. that I tell um, because, but, and actually part of the reason why it's been, um, 
it's still forthcoming it's because it's quite difficult and I, yeah. I feel it's a deeply personal story um mm. and so I'm not yet sure if I'm ready for that one to be out in the world just um you know feeling like um when we were in you know Andasi Bay I, I I fell apart and was put back together by nature, you know, and um, mm. and it happened also very quickly and and just really being yeah totally aware. I looked back over all the notes I was making because I was writing almost every day while we were on the trip, mm. um, yeah. and really feeling uh, a juxtaposition, really, and actually uh, often also um, a kind of synergy between what was happening for me internally and what was happening externally, um, and. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out how to represent that narratively. Um, mm. But it's been such a wonderful experience to have. Um, and I'm so looking forward to the publication coming mm. out by, from yeah. Cassava Republic Press Absolutely. Uh, next year at, and, you know, to be presented at next year's festival. Yeah. Um, and I guess that is where we will really... Um, hash out any remaining troubles between you and I. We will have that, <laughs> that arm yeah. wrestle yeah. <laughs> we over hope, a drink in Scotland next year. Yeah, I hope we can do that before then. Um, but, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been, it's been a so. real pleasure. I mean, I think um, finally that what, what feels even more significant after I returned from the trip, that was my last international trip up till now, um, especially in a year when I'm sure for you two, you had so much lined up, right? And this is not something that is peculiar to any of us, but the sense that you were coming back um, on the, the cloud of this, you know, global pandemic, um, but coming back in, a, in, in also in, a, in the, in, you know, in the sense of trying to figure out what was next, right? What would the world be after this? And I think that that opportunity to have traveled in, to be in a foreign place is now informing some of the considerations that we are making about the life that would um you know, come after. Um, yeah, so um, I was glad to have traveled with you. I hope that our we'll settle our scores before we, <laughs> meet, we can yes. see somewhere before then and, <laughs> and sort out all our issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, I yeah. think that's the other thing we have to thank the festival for. We have yes. a, hopefully, inshallah, a, a, a lifelong friendship over which Absolutely. to sort out issues for me to be reminding you of, of all the ways you've done me wrong because that would <laughs> it would be unfair to sort of, you know, forgive and move on. I think it's, yeah. it's important wow. to keep reminding you at, at regular intervals <laughs> yeah um but yeah emmanuel it's been so wonderful Same to speak here, with Liza. you again and thank yes. I, yeah forever thanking the edinburgh international book festival for the platform so that this could happen yes and um, finally i think we should point people or i'm um, you know we should point people to um, a bookshop link at the end of the site where this podcast will appear um certainly buy books buy good books buy by a particular the black black writers um, yes. around the world, it's important. Yeah, the time is now for that for sure. Thanks, yes. Emmanuel. Thanks, Until Eliza. very soon. Until soon. Bye. Bye.